Thank you. I got my, I had to go and come back and lost my mic. So they really are the kind of, um, in, in Europe and here, the, they have actually sort of been the, the, f the pioneers of this space. So with no further ado, Peter. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Actually, I think Mark Billinghurst is here. He's, he has done AR longer than us, definitely. Ah, okay. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking for Thomas. Thomas is also here. We, we both are the founders of Metayo, and uh, yeah, we're kind of uh, switching around uh, presentations. Um, I'm in the track on new form factors. Um, uh, we actually, from Metayo, we do everything on augmented reality, but we don't build devices. So I was kind of thinking, what am I doing in this uh, track? But I try to make it interesting. Um, another thing, of course, there's a lot of new exciting devices coming up, but I'm not allowed to talk about them, so that's my, my, my next problem. Um, but again, yeah, I'll, I'll share some thoughts with you. Just an introduction on, on Metayo. Um, we are now 10 years old, and um, it's been a very interesting ride. Um, my personal goal is actually writing a book in 2020, hopefully on being with AR from very, very early, <laughs> till uh, everyone uh, is using it anywhere on the world, every time, every day. Um, we're progressing. Um, we have around 50,000 developers working with our SDK. So we're a technology company trying to bring technology to, to others, and then they can build something on top of that. Um, and there's also a, a whole bunch of augmented reality users already. Uh, we, for example, did uh, something with IKEA last year. The IKEA catalog has like 220 million copies. That alone is, is quite a nice reach, and any of these 220 million catalogs was AI enabled, but of course not everyone used AI on it. Um, yeah, uh, one more thing. Uh, we are, as I said before, we are doing everything in AR except devices. We actually do hardware IP, so we do hardware chip uh, design for uh, accelerating augmented reality. We do software, we do content creation tools, and we also have our own uh, cloud-based augmented reality browser called Genio. Um, in terms of use cases, um, yeah, just to, to give you my opinion on killer use cases, there's not a single killer use case for augmented reality. Maybe you could say it's mobile computing in general. But there's all kinds of things that we can enhance and make 10 or 20 or 30 percent better by using augmented reality as a user interface. And um, there's some, some examples that we're seeing and, 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 and trying to put some categories around those. So we see micro AR, you know, working with objects like a bottle or your face uh, or your hands. Um, or maybe a car, that's like the maximum of a micro AR case. And then you can do indoor things, you can do indoor navigation, all these things are now becoming possible. And of course, it's good for AR because you know, there's more and more use cases where the user interface technology can, can bring value to, to the end user. And then there's of course the outdoor cases uh, where you, you know, walk around the city and in 2008, I remember when the first AIE AI was taking place, there was a big hype on AR browsers and you know, GPS and, and, and Compass. Um, that, of course, kind of changed, and, and we saw that the quality and the accuracy wasn't good enough. Uh, but this is now also changing, and we're, we're bringing a, a new level of experience in the outdoor experiences as well. Um, Metayo is now 10 years old, and that is interesting because we, we kind of uh, went through all kinds of different form factors. Um, yesterday, I, I was at a party and, and I was discussing with somebody about enabling technologies, and he was like, yeah, enabling technologies like Glass and Kinect and these things. And, and I said, well, actually, the iPhone was one of the major enabling technologies that I noticed on my path, because in, in 2003, when we started, a mobile device was a compact iPad. 
right? And it had it didn't have a camera. You had to like buy an add-on camera and, and plug it in. And uh, of course, it was super weak in terms of processing power. All these things. So uh, you know, we already have been through a major progress in form factors by you know having these mobile devices where a screen, a CPU, uh, and a camera are all connected. Um, I remember in 2008 we did a museum. Uh, guide in, in, in Japan in Japan somewhere and we actually built you know we had to take a, a laptop uh, and then put a webcam on top and then put a uh, IMU sensor on top all USB connected and then they built a clunky housing on it and then <laughs> they had these five kilos of, of device and they gave it to small children and uh, <laughs> you know and so so we we already forgot about all the beauty of of uh, you know, having tablets, having uh, uh, smartphones around, uh, it's already a big, big step. And I think the, the size of the industry now is already, because of that, much, much bigger. But there's new things uh, coming up. Uh, of course, this is actually an old slide I, I showed in 2011. And uh, of course, at some point, we're wondering, uh, now we have this wonderful new form factor. It's, you know, it's a touch screen. And you can make it bigger, you can make it flatter, but will this be it? You know, will we just make a very big, very flat, very light thing that looks exactly like the iPhone, um, or will will there new things come up? And I'm glad to to <laughs> to say I don't have a Google Glass slide, but of course Google Glass is one of the things. But uh, this is actually uh, a shot from 2004 around uh, where we worked with Daimler. Uh, and actually had head-mounted displays. At that time, they were made by Microvision, um, um, running in, in a real factory environment where people were working using the see-through head-mounted displays. Um, and people really uh, tried it for three months, and um, it was quite a successful use case. Um, and the decision, you know, what had to be made, will they make it productive, will they use it forever, or will they stop using it? And ultimately, uh, the decision was made against the device, and the main reason was that um, the women on the shop floor uh, felt like their hair cut was being um, destroyed, and <laughs> it sounds funny, and I know it's... it's uh, probably not politically correct to say this, but this was the result of the survey, that when you have to wear a, a clunky device like that, you have to have something on your head, it destroys your haircut, and uh, that's why people basically uh, voted to not use it, while on the other side, it really made their, their work much easier. And this, by the way, is Thomas. That's how he looked like 10 years ago. There's um, another th thing that, that is I interesting about new form factors. Um, there's also head-up displays uh, coming up. They're already in some cars, like the BMW 5 Series, but there will be probably uh, you know, change and might become bigger and things like that. Um, so we have uh, all kinds of new form factors that, change, that will change the use cases of AR because they will uh, change uh, this 10-minute, I, I, I look at an augmented reality marketing experience on a piece of paper experiences to I will drive my car from here to San Francisco. It takes me an hour, and I need the glasses maybe or the head-up display uh, to run for an hour efficiently uh, without eating up the battery. In a car, it's of course okay, but um, if it's an electric car, it becomes an issue. <laughs> And if it's a mobile device, it definitely becomes an issue. So we're happy to see these use cases uh, go from 10 minutes to hours. Museum, indoor navigation, all these things take much, much longer than just 10 minutes. And that's placing a lot of new requirements on us from the technology side. So one thing we did is we created what we call the AR engine. And it's really the first augmented reality hardwired logic. Um, now it becomes really technical, but hey, that's my job, so I'm sorry <laughs> to, to have you go through this. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, to, to really change uh, the world of augmented reality, we, we, we have to continuously uh, work on the details. And um, 
this is, is one of the details. So if you look at uh, a, a classical SOC, um, you can solve things doing it on a CPU, and that gives you about 1,000 milliwatts of power consumption per core, or you can do it in hardwired log logic, and that um, reduces the battery consumption by a factor of 1,000, for example. And that is um, something we, we have to solve, and I'm, I'm very uh, unhappy to tell you that these kinds of devices will not come out in the next two years because of the hardware cycles and these kinds of things going on. So if you have the feeling, uh, yeah, we are now finally there and next year will be it and we'll, it will all be done and we'll be ready and finish with the whole AR topic, I have to disappoint you. <laughs> it will take a few more years to have it on a, you know, German engineering, you're driving a BMW of AR kind of level. Um, but we're getting there, right? Uh, so there, there will be steps and steps and steps taking every six months with every major update of any of the great augmented reality companies that are working really hard uh, to, to improve the technology. And I could talk about five hours about technologically improvements, but uh, I don't have the time for that. Uh, so I will just uh, show one small example of uh, one of the things we're doing, for example, to improve outdoor augmented reality tracking. Um, so this is our office buildings in uh, Munich, Germany, um, and this is a laser scan to create ground truth data so we know exactly what we're looking at and we know exactly how we can measure the quality of our algorithms. This is a typical outdoor augmented reality view and we took about uh, 125 of them with uh, hundreds of thousands of individual images and we use these hundreds and thousands of individual images and, and other images to, to check our algorithms to make them work seamlessly without thinking about it, just you know, point at anything and make it work. And uh, one solution we came up with, this is by the way you know, a rough initialization using GPS and compass, but the quality is not really good. If you, if you take this as an initial guess, though, you can run specific improved matching al algorithms, not matching one specific point against all of the features, but just matching it to uh, the really close ones. And um, this, for example, gave improvements of factor 20 in the quality of initialization and the robustness of the algorithms. So there's many, many of these small little steps that are going on and that we have to take to make augmented, re augmented reality work seamlessly. For me, I always compare augmented reality to a touch screen. And imagine you had uh, your smartphone and the touch screen would work 90% of the time. So you touch it and every tenth time, ah, it doesn't work. Uh, and you can imagine how the, the success of the smartphone would have changed if we only achieved 90% success rate on the touch screen. And with augmented reality, we are pretty, pretty much on a, let's say, 60% level. Um, and unless we bring it to 100%, we won't be you know, able to fulfill the, the big expectations in terms of multi-billion dollar markets and all these kinds of things. So we have to keep uh, on working jointly, and the good news is, you know, companies like Qualcomm, companies uh, like, I uh, uh, can't officially say, but Qualcomm is officially doing, you know, big companies, or Google with Glass, are now starting to invest a lot of money and helping to uh, get this done. And, and at some point, uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Five years ago, I, I couldn't have told you how the final solution looked like, but we now have a serious uh, a good feeling of the exact steps we have to take to make this happen. So the good news is it will happen. The bad news is it will take two to three more years. So if you want to know more details, there's also another conference we do in October. Um, if you want, you can look out um, and visit me, us there and, and, and look at more um, you know, detailed demos and more detailed discussions. 
Um, another thing that I also want to share, even though it's not at all uh, concerned with form factors, to, to kind of tell you my opinion of where we are. Um, in, and this one is related to not form factors, but content. Um, this is the development of the global internet traffic according to Cisco um, over the years. So, um, and I kind of surprised me that, you know, we, that we take the internet for granted by now, but in 1994, you know, it was, I don't know, uh, can't see the exact, ah, terabytes per month. I don't know, it was like a few terabytes per month. Uh, of global internet traffic. And then at some point uh, around 2000, it really started taking off. But there's some interesting um, curves. The internet grew by 2.5% around every year in, in the last decades. And um, there was these 94, 95, 96 years where it uh, not grew by 2.5%, uh, uh, by 250%, but it really tenfolded. And, um, I looked at the Junaio cloud uh, traffic that we see, uh, and it's pretty much the internet of 1994. So we have achieved something. We are there where the internet was in 1994, but um, we're not in 2000 and we're not in 2005 when the internet really becomes uh, uh, not a gimmick anymore, let's say it that way. And um, so it's, it's all of our jobs you, us, and everyone involved to make these ten, tenfold kind of growth factors uh, happen by developing great applications, by creating great devices, by supporting um, the developers with great chipsets, if you're Intel, if you're NVIDIA, if you're Qualcomm. And um, if we do all that and if we keep on working together, I think at some point we can be sure we will become something like the Internet. So, uh, yeah, this is my call to action, basically. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Is it working? So I think everyone looks hungry, so if you don't, if you want to ask a question, I'll bring it down. Can I see any hands, any questions? I see hunger. Hunger, <laughs> bathroom break, coffee. So come back here because we have our headliners on un after lunch, and please take a moment to explore the expo because it's super interesting. Thank you. <laughs>